coming up on Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat. Today we spoke with... David Dunn, welcome back. Last time we saw each other, we were all frequenting the Irish Open in the pissing rain, remarking on your cap. How, how's life? What was that like? And how's life been since? Yeah, great. I mean, it's always a nice day to get down to get down to the golf and bump into some people up on the, the side of the fairway um, or at the back of the rough, actually, <laughs> where we're following around at that stage. But yeah, things are good. Things are good. Um, everything's moving on the hexa side of things. And then as always, uh, whenever I can, try to get out to watch my brother play as well. Yeah, you mentioned triple job in the last day. You were mixing work with Hexus. You were caddying for Paul. How are you managing to squeeze it all in? Well, the caddying was actually a funny story. That was that was completely unintentional and accidental. So I, myself and Professor Graham Close, we do a bit of consultancy for the DP World Tour. And really what that entails is providing some nutrition support or availability of nutrition support through the European tour performance Institute across a range of events throughout the course of a season. And a lot of that is building up towards the Ryder cup. You know, can we get the right processes in place? Are we speaking to the right people as well as improving the food availability and service provision at those specific events? And I happen to be in Rome for that event because that's where the Ryder cup will be next year. And I was due to fly back on, was it Tuesday night or Wednesday morning? And I think on the Sunday, Paul was, it could have been like eight reserve, hadn't, hadn't managed to, to get in yet. So at that stage, you think like there's, there's no way he'll get into that competition. And then on Monday, it came down a little bit more. And then it sort of got to the back end of Tuesday. And I'm here wrapping up, packing up the laptop, getting ready to go. I think he was down to second reserve and then quickly first reserve. And we're sort of trying to figure out, well, his caddy is away on holidays because they had planned to have the week off. So he phoned me and said, look, if I get in here, can you just stay? Because I don't have a caddy. And lo and behold, that was it. He, he managed to get in late Tuesday night, um, didn't pack the bags. And then he got a very early flight out on the Wednesday morning to, to get out a bit groggy and try try work his way through some practice before he got into it. What do you like as a caddy? Are you I was just going to say, yeah. what's, what's the caddying bit like? Are, are you good? And I was good on the hydration side of things. I had sufficient snacks, but when he turned around and asked for the number, that was, <laughs> I was uh, that was not, not my forte. I was quickly trying to learn how to read a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. What would be the snacks? So you're going around, we're playing around in a couple of weeks. What would, what would you be giving us over the 18 holes? Yeah, sure. I suppose energy expenditure throughout golf is, it can vary from individual to individual. I know, Graham has done some work. Uh, he's got some active heart data looking at the typical energy expenditure. But, you know, a lot of golfers can sort of vary. They can burn anything from maybe five up to 800 calories during a round of golf and a little bit of practice in the lead up before. But in, on the tour, a typical round of golf is not like a typical round of golf for us where it could last three and a half, four hours. Courses are a bit shorter. Um, out there, you could be out for five and a half, six hours. So it, it tends to be quite long. That particular course, the back nine was quite hilly, quite hilly for golf. I think the elevation from, you know, from top to the peak of the course was about 84 meters, but it was just really lumpy on the back nine, more than what they'd typically be exposed to. And it was quite hot. We're in Italy now, so we're talking 30, 32 degrees on a daily basis. So there's a few different considerations. And I think for us, it's really drilling into making sure that they're staying hydrated. So we might include some electrolytes in their fluids um, and sort of keep drinking regularly. Like I think the, the drink to thirst or that ad lib drinking maybe doesn't really apply to golf because you can kind of get around. And by the time you are thirsty, you've, you're probably down quite a bit already. So mm -hmm. proactively taking on fluids every 15 to 20 minutes, even if it's a few mouthfuls, um, isn't a bad idea around the course in that heat. Obviously, you're playing at the Irish Open and getting absolutely drenched. It's, it's slightly less of a concern because that, that actual fluid loss through sweat is going to be significantly less. And in terms of eating, we typically see, I would say we see three typical eating patterns from pro golfers. Um, it's essentially people that eat two, three, or four times throughout the course of their round. You've got some golfers that like to have a you know, bigger, more substantial meal before and just keep a couple of snacks where they could be sort of oat and protein-based flapjack bars, 
that might also have um, some good quality fats in there. So the energy content of the bar could be quite high. It could be 250, maybe even as high as 400 calories. Um, and they might have one or two of those throughout the round. Other people, they might like to eat three or four times. Um, and they could look at some slightly lighter snacks, but it could be like banana, nuts, um, one of those bars, and maybe half a wrap or something like that. But it's it's interesting because the tea times can catch some people like you get out early, you're going to have breakfast, play on the course, come in and have lunch. You get that awkward 10, 30, 11, 11 a.m. tea time. You're kind of not really getting in until closer to dinner. So you kind of have to bring your lunch solutions with you on the course. And golfers are normally so tuned into psychological processes, their mental state that they're in. Do they know the majority now I'm speaking, would they be aware of that? Maybe they're lacking in nutrients at a time when they're maybe they're making wrong decisions or they're starting to think I'm getting a bit hazy in terms of my decision making at the moment. I actually think it's a really important role for the caddy. I don't think that's ever front and foremost to the player's mind. I think like when the player's hungry, they might, they might eat, but they get so wrapped up in the round. You know, you're trying to get to the ball. What's the number? What score do I need to make? How am I going to play this? There's so many other thought processes that are going on. I, I think that's a really good opportunity for the caddy to take a proactive role and sort of literally hand them him or her something and say, listen, let's have this. Let's have a few mouthfuls of water. Look for the opportunities in between shots. Um, every, whatever it might be, three, four or five holes to make sure that they're staying on top of it. So I put it more on the caddy than the player, although the player is ultimately responsible, but I think the caddy can help um, give the player one less thing to think about in that particular instance. We'd love to nearly dive into behavioral change a little bit. Obviously you're specializing in it now, PhD, nutrition, behavioral change and tech, which we'll, which we'll touch on. Um, what are you learning through that process and maybe what elements of that come into the golf world and also obviously Hexus? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a massive question. <laughs> um, recording for another. <laughs> yeah. I think I've got one high level learning certainly from my PhD research and then actually trying to build and launch a product into the market that's now generating revenue is and I don't know if this sounds cynical. There's so much good research and academic processes out there, but there's a lot of theoretical work in behavior change. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of very good models that, that really do capture the core tenets. But let's say something like motivation, for example, and we take, we take a, a very well-established behavioral model, so the combi model, at the center of that behavior change wheel, and we know that, okay, for the behavior to occur, somebody does need the capability, the opportunity, the motivation, and they'll all have their individual factors that sit below that. So in motivation, we're looking at reflective and automatic motivation, and that could be further mapped onto the theoretical domains framework. And when you're reading it, it all makes sense. And you can see as a practitioner, having worked with people, it's like, okay, this might be a gap that they have. And it almost really helps with this barriers and enablers piece. But motivation is not static. So if you're building an intervention, you say, right, I'm going to do this to target motivation, but then on what day, for what person, in what context, the setting, you know, there's been some other work where it's looked at motivation and measured at 400 times over 400 days. And if you take six time points, you could start to say, oh, it's trending down. Or you take 12 time points, you could say, oh, actually it's trending up. But when you look at it over 400 days, it is deterministic chaos. And that's only one time point in the day. So even today, you, me, we might be more or less motivated to do something at a certain time because an internal or external event has triggered a response in us. And I think the thing that I'm, I'm really enjoying now in the tech space is probably starting to gain an appreciation for that. And what's the best way? The academic base should always inform the practice but the tech is going to move quicker than the universities. And actually you're sort of moving more from big, large scale research projects into AB testing and trying to learn things iteratively and quickly. So probably that, and maybe not getting anchored in just one, one model of behavior as well. So obviously you've got that, that com B model, but then you've got the BMAP model from somebody like BJ Fogg, who has a, has a lot of, I mean, he's a phenomenal practitioner as well as researcher and the stuff that he's done in a very applied space, you know, you can't ignore it. 
where he will look at things a bit more on a bit more of a dynamic basis. And maybe some of his students near Real and what he's done mm -hmm. to bring to life things like the hooked model, you can't, you can't anchor yourself in one. You know, I think our job is really to get in amongst all of them and try to figure out where the signal and the noise is and how can we take those different elements and look at how best we breed them into what we're designing, developing and delivering. One thing is coming across is like, it's very complex. So in order when we're tackling something that's complex, we need to have an abundance of resources. You're looking into technology and you mentioned it there at the end. How do you think, or what do you think is the biggest piece that you need to, or hurdle you need to get over first for Hexes to really become mainstay and something that comes to the forefront of athletes and people alike? I think there's probably two things. I think there's like, there's a, there's an answer that I would give maybe to, to an athlete and then maybe a different answer to a practitioner. I think for an athlete, you know, at the core of the product, it's really helping people periodize their nutrition in line with the demands of their activity. Um, dietary periodization for some people is an advanced concept. People are eating the same each day, despite their exercise being very different. Um, but when we're looking at the wider population, so I think, you know, getting people to recognize the massive potential benefits, not potential, the massive benefits of periodizing your nutrition um, would be one when I look at the wider consumer base. And then I think as for more of a practitioner viewpoint as well, I think it's just making sure that we keep layering in that little bit of additional functionality that we know we want the product to have to really rock it, rock it through. So we have a very strong backbone at the minute. Yeah. Um, the science is good, but there's that a few touches of additional functionality that just offer huge value to the users that we're currently deep in the weeds of building at the minute. And it's really a race for us to get that done as quickly as we can. And that race is a function of, it's a function of finance and resources. Um, so that's the, the interesting challenge we sort of navigate on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, it's funny. You don't have to be the best. You have to be first. That's what they say sometimes in business skills, but. Yeah. I mean, it's funny as well. You, you kind of read this stuff from, from Peter Thiel and that's that thing. And it's, it's not always the first, it's about being the last, um, you know, can you stay alive long enough? to be able to capture that percentage of the market and sort of, you know, build your consumer base. So it's always interesting, isn't it? There's so many different thought processes and yeah. different things, but nothing's like it until you're in the storm. Yeah. And Instagram quotes and everything like that. And you think, Oh, that's the one. <laughs> yeah. The less time spent on Instagram, the better. So talk to us, you know, you're coming up with Hexus, you know, getting seed capital, getting it off the ground. You're seeing it developing. What's that feel like? What's going through your, through your gut, through your heart, through your head when you're, when you're seeing your idea start to come off the ground a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's a really unusual, I suppose, thing to think about and reflect on. Um, I probably never would have considered myself an entrepreneur. It's probably the honest answer. And then you kind of like, you probably have to lean into it a bit more and go, actually, yeah, you know, you're raising money, you're building new things that's generating money. Um, I think it comes back and we spent, I, I personally spent a lot of time sort of diving into sort of the, the why over the last couple of years, as we did start to grow and start to realize, okay, well, like, wh why do I actually do this? Why did I become a nutritionist? Why did I decide to do a PhD? Like, how did it, how did we end up in this position where we're now, you know, running a tech company, um, albeit small and starting off. And I think for me, it sort of comes back to that core piece, which is like why I do what I do is, is very much about helping people realize their potential. And I think that's how I fell into sports performance. I really enjoyed working with people and seeing, okay, this person's going to the Olympics. This person's going to a World Cup. This person's playing their first game as a senior adult athlete. Um, and I think as it spilled into to this space, I think you could see the potential to help more people realize their potential and even within a team work with people from very different backgrounds and each help each other get more from themselves i've really enjoyed that you know i i completely existed in an echo chamber prior to coming into this physio speaks to sports scientists speaks to nutritionists speaks to coach read same research listens to same podcasts has roughly aligned ideologies of how things work and then you get thrown in a room with an engineer a data scientist an interaction designer, the conversations are phenomenal. It makes you think about things the way, you know, you get asked questions you've never been asked before and quite simple questions. Going back to things like the jobs to be done framework, you go, oh, well, this has to happen. It's like, well, what job is it doing? Where's the value? 
what's that experience? And you kind of, you start to think about things differently. And now in many ways, I can't think about them the way I used to think about them. You kind of realize how many flaws is the wrong word, but maybe how little we thought about problems in elite sport. We would typically fill a problem with a knowledge-based solution as opposed to designing an effective intervention to actually influence something on a bigger scale. So that diversity of thought is huge. And you're talking about maximizing human potential and potential in others. Do you notice that has shifted? It maybe you've been client facing before you're now a CEO. Do you have that same aspect with your team, with the people you work with, like the data scientists or the interaction specialist? Are you looking to maximize their careers as well? And what's that like as a CEO? Yeah, 100%. Like we, we say it to everyone that joins the team. It's, it's not a, like we, we kind of have to make sure our whys are kind of aligned that, you know, they're still getting something from this because ultimately if this is your first job, it's naive of me to think, well, you're going to want to stay with us forever yeah. because, you know, maybe you could want to go on. Maybe you could be, this is your entry level position. You could be running a department. They could have their own ideas in a few years. So I think it's, it's really important to support and foster everyone within the team. We've got, you know, certain members of the team now who are, who are rock stars, you could look at them and go, you could go into a different role with a different title and still be exceptional at this, you know? And there's, as a result, I think we're lucky that we kind of have a team of people that they can wear different hats because as a small team and as a startup, people can take on more responsibility and really lead on certain areas. And some areas are going to be new to them, but, you know, people are clever, quick, um, and enjoy the challenge. So it's, yeah, I think, it, I think it's really important. And like I said, it's, you know, you, you kind of have to look at them in the eye and go, well, in 20 years time, you kind of want to be able to sit down and, and have a pint and go, wow, look, like, look at what you've done. Um, and, you know, if you can be a small part of that, then that's great. It's the same when you get interns or placement students as well as team members. And likewise for me, I learn a huge amount from them. Like I'm not saying they, everything they learn is from me at all. Like, I will absorb and learn a huge amount from, from them. They're helping shape my development at the minute as well. It's, it's very two-way and sort of cross-disciplinary in that instance. What, what's it look in terms of scale at the moment? You know, you're kind of saying team, small startup growing, but you know, we're, we're looking, you're starting to go places now. You're just coming across as extremely humble. So what's it, <laughs> what's it look like and kind of how big are you and kind of what are you hoping to achieve over the next six months or a year? Yeah, so the team has grown. Um, we're up to 10 now. And again, not all full-time, some part-time, some doing some consultancy work. Um, in terms of scale, I think as a, you know, we we are building a nutrition product. It's a sports tech product. Um, but we're a technology company. So I think if when we're looking at growth in terms of the team specifically, I think engineering is, is a very valuable resource. And ultimately, if we're looking to improve product, build new features, engineering is, is going to be more engineering capacity is always going to be required for that. So I certainly see scale there, probably other areas within the team that you'd say areas that we, we will have learned to do ourselves. How can we sort of add more resources to give us more speed on that side of things as well? So I kind of view us in sort of probably two, we're kind of two phases at the minute. We've launched, we know we need to build a product. So there's a big focus on product and engineering now. As we fill uh, or as we introduce some of those new product features that we're working on, we're, we're going to be pushing on more of a growth phase because we answer more of those consumer questions about the current product. That's when it, I suppose it leans more into the sort of sales, marketing, acquisition um, funnel. So we're all, look, we're always selling, we're always building, but I think they sort of, at certain stages, some become, some take a little bit more of our time than others, just of the nature of where we're at. Speaking into the, the new features, one I'm personally very excited about live energy because I think, yeah, I think it's something that the market hasn't really seen before, especially in, in the, the space of the opportunity and the, the visual aspect that it gives to a user in order to understand. Because we're seeing a lot of wearables, we're seeing people take on board, okay, I can see how much my strain is and things like that. My sleep is last night. I can apply essentially my training principles to what's going on at the moment. But with energy, with, with food, this is something that I think would be a game changer. Tell us a bit more about live energy and what you're hoping for it to achieve. Yeah, sure. So I suppose for those that aren't aware, live energy is a feature that we've been working on behind the scenes for, well, for almost a year now and 
really what we wanted to do was provide something that actually gave you minute by minute visual insights into your energy throughout the course of the day. And probably there's a number of different reasons why we wanted to do it. But I suppose at the top level, we felt that nutrition for too long had taken this 24 hour view. Here's the calories you need to eat and here's the macronutrients you need to eat for the day. But when we're looking at people that are performing and really trying to optimize their health um, in line with that performance, we know that things like their endocrine system is going to act on real time changes in energy intake and energy expenditure. And when you get it wrong, people can ha- can suffer big problems. And we look at things like under fueling uh, impacts and symptoms on things like reds. So that relative energy deficiency in sport, knock on impacts as well on things like menstrual dysfunction kind of say, well, somebody could actually be doing their best based on the tools and technology that they currently have, but they're still not able to, I suppose, give their health and performance the best chance to succeed. So we wanted to build something that really put them in control of their energy and actually showed them that interaction. So, you know what, if you do skip this meal and you're trying to perform at 6 p.m., you know, are you putting yourself into a hole that maybe you can't get out of? So not just understand the total amounts of foods and the timing through the carbohydrate coding uh, feature as well, but actually start to uh, consider the timing of that and how to be periodizing your energy throughout the day to make sure that you're in the best place possible uh, when it comes to that performance event. Love the way you're kind of getting the overarching principles but then going down to something like that that seems very detailed but can really make a difference so just that's amazing to hear i'd love to ask you a little bit david about the new science and kind of what's coming out there at the moment we don't i don't always read nutrition papers or keep up with that that world per se um what's kind of interesting you at the moment and, and maybe what's coming into the world of of hexus yeah no it's a great question i actually Again, it's another big question. How long do you have? Um, <laughs> the thing that thing that really fascinates me, and we probably touched on the start, and it's probably a bit of a frustration, is I feel in nutrition we operate in quite a theoretical space. We say that this could help, and here's how we'll deliver this behavioral intervention, or we need more behavioral interventions. Then you turn around and say, well, go and do it. Somebody go and actually design it. Tell us, did it work? Did it not work? Why didn't it work? Who did it work for? For me personally, I'm I'm really interested in actually the implementation science of what we already know, because we know a lot of information about what our body needs to function, to fuel, to recover, to repair, but actually helping people deliver those behaviors is is something that we probably know less about. I think implementation science has been a gap. So specifically things that excite me at the minute that I think we're going to come into nutrition, I don't think they're, they're there right now, are things like digital phenotyping and that feeding into just-in-time adaptive interventions. So looking at, in many ways, continuous tuning interventions. So instead of me sitting down with you and saying, well, let's have a consult, we'll discuss your nutrition needs and we'll talk about X, Y, and Z, actually being able to harvest some digital trace data from your phone to say, you're in this place and you've just done this workout and maybe now is a good time to push that message which may motivate you or educate you to help support that behavior or at least trigger that thought process. So looking at what are those external triggers that prompt that action that actually are going to get you could or could not get you to do something and then start to work out what works for individuals. So I think that whole psychological sphere is completely, yeah, it, it's, it's really been missed. And I was actually, there was a, there was a digital health conference on in Galway this week, which I missed, which I was really, really good at about, but we had to go and, and do some filming but I managed to catch up with one of the researchers who we'd done some work with uh, in the airport just before she caught her, fi- caught her flight. Mm-hmm. Professor Elena Smith was over from the University of Amsterdam. We collaborated, but it must have been a year, a year and a half ago now during our beta trial. And we started to profile athletes for their level of autonomy. So we tried to repeat some of the work that she'd done in the Dutch population who were using mobile devices for their health. And from that previous work, you were able to sort of classify people as self-reliers. So... I'm in charge of what I do. I'm, you know, I'm going to lead on this. Don't really need your help. Uh, expert dependence, people that will lean on us as experts. And, you know, typically the expert takes the lead and they'll follow suit. Uh, confirmation seekers, so they like to lead, but they like to be, you know, get that confirmation from something. And the other ones were, were indifference where there was fewer of those. But we profiled just under a thousand athletes for their level of autonomy. And we got some phenomenally 
uniform results that we found a lot of athletes displayed this confirmation seeking um, level of autonomy, which again, this is something that we need to write up and publish. Um, but like I said, I'm always, always keen to share because I don't, by the time it's written and it's published, you know, we almost want people to be taking these things on board um, and implementing them in their practice. But that was a really interesting insight for us because it meant now actually we need to be empowering the athlete and enabling the athletes as opposed to just relying on them coming to us. So at the same time, we were running our beta trial where we had given all these athletes access to some of the top practitioners in the world. People that have been working with British Cycling, Professional Jockeys Association, they could message them whenever they wanted. And it was interesting that they didn't really do too much of it. And when we spoke to the athletes after, and we started to understand a little bit more, the biggest job that they were doing was actually giving them confidence in what their plan was for that day or that week. So on the back of that, we decided to build one of the new features in the platform called Fuel Coach, which is literally a tool that looks at over a 72 hour window, the type, the intensity, the duration of your activity, what you did yesterday, what you're doing today and what you're doing tomorrow and pushes a message to you to say, well, this is why it looks like the way it looks like. And here's the key thing you need to focus on. So we wanted to build something that actually supported that confirmation seeker level of autonomy in them and also solved the problem, which is giving me that little bit of confidence and clarity in what I'm seeing in terms of my plan. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's, I'd like to see more of this in the, the nutrition research, which is just helping us actually implement change. It's great to hear insights about features and try and understand why they're being, why they're being added and, and the actual depth that goes into stuff like the fuel coach. Sometimes with wearables, especially just because the, the realm is sort of, it's new and novel at recently over the last five years, we get these insights like strain and sleep and, and insights about our readiness level. You don't really know what to do with them a lot of the time. And even if you are confirmation seeking, you kind of don't know what information you need to hear. So you kind of ask people amongst in your circles, in your environment, what do you do with that? What, yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah. My strain was 16 yesterday and I was walking around. Do I need to look at that? Am I ready to go? And it can kind of just build into behaviors that are the group norm. So confirmation bias in maybe the non-experts or the people you're just in proximity to. So I think with that research, is there a way that you can maybe support that with the human approach? So I know you've mentioned sort of a hybrid knowledge um, provision. So giving it out with the technology, but also with the human. Can people sign up for interacting with someone like a, a field coach on a day to day? And then can it go back to a technology basis on a monthly period or something like that? Yeah, sure. Um, from that side of things, I suppose it's, I suppose the tools and technology that we're building are really to help empower the athletes, help them fuel smarter so that they can perform better, recover faster and adapt more effectively to the exercise that they're doing. We're not there to, to I suppose, to completely replace a nutritionist, um, which I think is an important thing to point out because a lot of the people that have actually uptaken the app so far, we've had a huge uptake within that endurance athlete space. We've also had a huge uptake from practitioners that are looking for tools and technology that can help them deliver a more continuous and scalable service so that they're not being pushed to WhatsApp at 10 o'clock at night to say, what should I do here? My training's just been modified, but that that athlete can sort of take charge of that now. It's still, obviously, I've spent the last 10 years working as an applied practitioner. And I'd still say the most valuable use of my time and the most valuable use of a practitioner's time is building relationships with athletes, building trust, and doing what humans are good at. Now, what technology is providing us with the opportunity to do now is to use computers for what they're good at, which is solve those algorithmic tasks in a day that would otherwise have a practitioner stuck behind a laptop and take four hours of what time they have at that particular club or organization and now pump that back into being in the locker room, being in the food room, having a few conversations with the injured players on the side of the pitch or in the gym. So, so that, that would kind of be my, my take on that side of things. And it's actually something that because the uptake from practitioners was probably more than what we expected in the first three months of trading, we've introduced, I suppose we're going to call it the coach desktop into our roadmap. And it's something that we'll be addressing next year, which is actually giving them an office to say, well, you know, if, you're, if your athletes are using this platform, we still want to give you the complete oversight and the complete control to say, okay, Here's everything they're seeing. Maybe you want to tweak this. You know, maybe we have some predicted ORM or data, but you've got some metabolic cart data that you might want to overwrite. So 
you know, we very much want to work with practitioners over uh, in particular, well, on an ongoing basis, but in particular over the next year to make sure that we're giving them the right solutions and providing the right solutions for them. And I think you mentioned as well about being client facing. We're still client facing since we've launched. I'd say I've spoken to, I don't know how many hours, probably about 500 hours at this stage of just speaking to people that have bought the app, have had questions, haven't bought, have had, you know, want to find out more. Those conversations are so valuable. So you can really start to understand what, what problem you're solving for them, where the value is and, and what jobs they need to do in their day as well that we can help facilitate. What, what's the balance between you as a founder having a vision for Hexus and what it's all about and why it started and what I wanted to be in five or 10 years, but then also getting this really interesting feedback, real time, getting this data from consumers, from the practitioners, and then obviously everything is evolving as a consequence. So what's that looking like in terms of, well, this is what it was supposed to be. This is what I wanted it to look like, but it's changing because Kiran says we need a bit more of that. And David was interested in a bit more of this. So what's that looking like? It's a humbling process because no matter what you think is something is going to be or what you want it to do, like there are fundamentally assumptions and your assumptions will get tested as soon as somebody decides to pay or not pay for something and tell you what they think of it and what they think it is. So I think it's been, it's been a real eye opener to me as well, but, you know, especially coming from sport where you get brought in and you're the expert in this space and you come up with the solutions and you deliver the solutions, but it's a much more collaborative process in terms of how you create value and how you solve problems. And, and I really enjoy it because you get this really honest, raw feedback of what they actually think and how they think things work. And it, you know, it tests your assumptions. Now, from that side of things, it, it's actually accelerated how quickly we can move because the more people we speak to, the more user testing we do, um, you know, whether that's looking at wireframes in advance and running things like concurrent think aloud protocols or speaking with practitioners and sort of having more focus group style conversations or just somebody having used the product and just telling us exactly their thoughts you can really refine your roadmap as a, as a tech company to say, okay, well, this is where we need to spend our money. This is where we're going to help these people Good. fundamentally, again, realize their potential and where the product really holds its value. Reminds me of uh, Airbnb's founder's startup story. They were getting rejected left, right, and center around hotels where, by, where sort of drawn back on it, drawn back on the idea but then they went around and spoke to the early adopters, the ones that were taken on board, and they refined the product completely based off the users on the ground. So I think if Airbnb or any sort of trajectory to go by, we'll watch this space for you, yeah? yeah well, hopefully we'll wait and see. Like I said, we have a really good team behind it at the minute. I think you know, for anyone that is a user or has considered being a user who's listening to this um, and sort of joining that community, and it is very much a community, like there's... I'll be speaking to somebody in Australia. It could be 1 a.m. my time, but I just want to hear what they think. I want to hear why, it's, why it is working. I want to hear from somebody why it's not working. You're, we're really at this place where we're really lucky that our members are really helping shape the future of this product and what this looks like for other people. I think it's a really nice time to get involved in, you know, because we are fundamentally a startup now that, that's continually progressing, but we do want to build the future of sports nutrition. We do want to build something that if we look at how we do what we do, we, you know, we translate some of that more complex and nuanced science of human performance into personalized daily nutrition practices based on your workouts, your lifestyles, your goals. But ultimately what we want to give you is something that is helps you fuel smarter, perform better and recover faster. And if you're someone in that space who is listening, reaching out, whether you do want to buy it or don't want to buy it, still please get in touch because we're, we're just keen to hear how we can build a solution that, that offers value to you and helps you perform better. Our three is going to be asking about, I'm going to be asking all about the food and what we should be having <laughs> for energy. And is it fish or is this, or is it this, 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 but um, that was brilliant. David, you, you've, you've been here before you, uh, you probably answered a question like this before, but we'd love to ask you as a man now who's really going on a journey, still learning each and every day and growing a team and leading that team, what does high performance look like for you? 
I actually, do you know what? I had thought about this answer a few weeks ago as I was listening, not even a few weeks, but within the last few months as I was listening to a few more of the podcasts and the different stories that you guys were creating. And I, I feel like I had a sharper answer back then, but I do remember refining it a little bit. I certainly think in terms of high performance, I think it is, it is around, I suppose, an everyday purposeful pursuit. It is something that you sort of live and breathe every day. Uh, I'd maybe say, let's say the, the everyday purposeful pursuit of, of a goal. So I think there's some spillover behaviors that just come out, you know, because it's so hard to stay at that intensity every day. You know, we know in high performance, people leading up to an Olympics, maybe obviously it's a four year cycle. You get into Olympic year, things the, the heat dials up. You get 12 weeks before world champs, the heat dials up. But I think there are little things that are you, you do every day that make the difference. The small tasks that just move in that little, little rock puts you in a better position for the next day. So, yeah, that's probably a long-winded answer. I actually, I was looking, that was, that's what I was looking on my phone for just before. <laughs> I've written this down. I start looking through my notes and I go, I have too many notes. <laughs> That's all right. We know I'm you prep well. Again. Yeah. And wearing the same clothes every day. That's a that's a high performance habit, like this reggae all jumper. You're just you're removing hair. Uh, yeah, removing one piece of cognitive load from your yeah. day. You the same same attire every day. One less thing to think yeah, about. Coffee I'll shops, podcasts, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, thanks a million. It's always great to catch up. We're really excited for everything that's going on with Hexus. We're always keeping a keen eye on it and to hear just even the depth of the the reasons behind why you're what you're doing. So thanks for sharing all that. 